Uh, today's uh, lecture is going to be on the formation and the origins of political parties among Assyrians. What, what does that mean exactly? Before the uh, before turning on the uh, the um, um, video and allowing you to come in, I had a discussion with Sarah, and I asked her to name uh, Assyrian political parties. And I was uh, joking around a little bit. There's a scene in Monty Python's Life of Brian. I don't know if any one of you have have seen that film um it's the um it's a story of these um well it's a story of it's a mock story of uh the the um jesus story and it's and it talks about and it or it features the judeans during the time of the romans yes joshua caught that right away joshua <laughs> So uh, when we talk about Assyrian political parties, we may say, you know, it's the Assyrian um, democratic movement, or it's the Assyrian liberation movement, or it's the Assyrian democratic party, or it's the Assyrian democratic movement, and so on and so forth. And so you might have a tough time keeping track of these various political parties, but uh, I'll help you maneuver through them today. Um, and in, in the life of Brian, if you ever, um, Google it or, or search for it on YouTube, this particular scene of the Judean front uh, the Judean pe people's front of Judea, it's a, it's a group of a handful of people sitting on, um, or sitting in, in, uh, some kind of an amphitheater, Roman amphitheater in, in, uh, Jerusalem or in Judea. And uh, they're approached and they're asked if they are indeed members of the Judean People's Front. And they get very offended and say, no, we are the People's Front of Judea. And then there's a play with various names. And it turns out that the entire, you know, all of these groups are just uh, a handful of individuals who don't get along. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's funny that way. But certainly the history of Assyrian political parties is not... Uh, a funny history, but it might um, make you think about, you know, their significance and their power in the world, given your view, um, whether, whether you look at the formation of political parties or of political groups or organizations from a realistic or an idealistic perspective. So it might give you a different perspective of the value uh, that these political parties had or have uh, either in the past or uh, their role in the future. So with that, let's begin. The formation of Assyrian political body, bodies or parties. What are we talking about here? We first want to understand what characterizes Assyrian uh, political groups? Uh, how have they come together? What is their goal? And if we can just give some themes to the, these Assyrian political parties, we would say that they are concerned with the existence of the Assyrian people as a nation. Um, they are across the board concerned about recognition of the Assyrian people or the Assyrian nation. Oftentimes the term nation is used rather than, for example, scattered communities. They're concerned about historical legitimacy and the identity of the Assyrian people. So there are various discussions and you know, these days you might see on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, on, on Instagram, and so on, discussions of, well, why are we referred to as Christians? Um, why are we referred to as Assyro-Chaldeans? Why do people refer to us as Chaldeans? We shouldn't be called Chaldeans. We should be called Assyrians. So these discussions often go on 
and they go to the heart of a concern about historical legitimacy and identity for various political parties. And some, you know, advocate this in a very serious way. There's also a concern about the covenant between the past and the present, uh, the Assyrian covenant of maintaining the existence of the um, uh, Assyrian past um, in an idealistic way, one could say. And there's also a concern on the part of many of these political parties for a share of decision-making power. And with that, of course, comes positions and funds. And certain parties, and I will focus on one today as being a very important political party that's had a major significant role among Assyrians, and that is the Assyrian Democratic Movement, often referred to as Zoa. Zoa in Assyrian means movement. And uh, you will know that if you, if you speak Assyrian, of course, you will know that Zoa are the diacritical marks that are used in the writing of the Assyrian. So Zoa refers to this particular movement. So all of these concerns are what characterize various Assyrian political parties that have come in the past and are, at, in most cases, still around today. Well, what, do, what concerns do Assyrians have also as a people, as a nation? Land rights, are they concerned about collective rights? Are they concerned about human or individual rights? Are they concerned about allocation rights in terms of economic um, allocation? What is allotted to the Assyrians? What is allotted to say other ethnic groups? and representative rights. What rights do Assyrians have? Now, today in Iraq, the Assyrians used to have, one could say, depending on how one characterizes the Assyrians, representative rights, whereas today, perhaps they say, well, we do not really have representative rights. Now, some may say, well, we still do as Christians. And then the countervailing point would be, well, we're not Assyrians, uh, we're Assyrians, we're not simply Christians. So the representatives in the Iraqi parliament today uh, are members of a party that is not the Assyrian Democratic Movement, which was the most organized and widespread political party in Iraq. They are members of uh, a Shiite-sponsored group um, under the rulership of uh, Riyan al Kaldani, who happens to be a member of the Chaldean Church, but who is espouses the rights of all Christians, does use this terminology of Chaldean, Syriac, Assyrian, uh, but he is certainly under the influence of Iran rather than, say, the Assyrian Democratic Movement, which had an alliance with the United States and was working with various Kurdish parties. Uh, in the Kurdistan region. So it's important to know that politics is a set of activities that are associated with making decisions in groups or other forms of power relations between individuals, such as distribution or resources of status. So it's about the distribution of resources. Most uh, oftentimes scholars describe politics as the question of who gets what, when, where, and how. How do we distribute that which we have? And what are Assyrian, uh, excuse me, what are political parties or organizations? A group of persons organized to acquire and exercise political power. It's always about power and power has to do with resources. Political parties originated in their modern form in Europe specifically in uh, Sweden, often is attributed to having the very first political party going back to the 1700s, 1719, and the United States in the 19th century, along with the electoral and parliamentary systems whose development reflects the evolution of parties. The term party 
has since come to be applied to all organized groups seeking political power, whether by democratic elections or through violence or revolution. In Assyrian, the term that is used for party is gebba, gebba. So there's a difference between being an Assyrian and being a member of an Assyrian organization. There are many prominent Assyrians who are at times politically active, at other times they are not politically active, but they are Assyrian. So some personalities who are important in both the United States and in the Middle East and in Russia uh, happen to be uh, members of other political parties. For example, Anna Ishu is a congresswoman in California. Tariq Aziz was a prominent member of the Ba'ath Party, who actually never uh, called himself an Assyrian, although his, his original name uh, was not Tariq Aziz, it was Yohanna Mette. And he was from the Nineveh Plain of Assyrian or Chaldean parents. And he had a very prominent role in the government of Iraq during its uh, reign under the Ba'athist and under specifically Saddam Hussein. Um, Victor Qambar was a very important political figure and uh, public relations personality in Washington, DC. He's in his 80s now. You see him in the center here. Um, Adam Benjamin was a congressman from Indiana and had a very um, uh, great a very good reputation. Um, none of these people were members of a political party, although the top figure, Sergis Aragan, uh, played a role in Assyrian activities in the Kurdistan regional government and supported many Assyrian projects. And of course, uh, Giorgis was, General Giorgis is, uh, was, uh, he has since passed away a very important personality in Syria's military um, uh, forces. Uh, Kalamanov is a Russian Assyrian. None of these figures are really, or were, I should say, um, members of an Assyrian political party or drove an Assyrian agenda, uh, other than I would say Sergis Arajan, uh, and we can talk about that in the question and answer session but he certainly had a role in the Kurdistan regional government. Now, some people attribute to uh, Sergis Arajan a motivation to assist the Kurds rather than the Assyrians, uh, but other Assyrians see in him a, uh, a former, formerly a ray of hope for various uh, villages which he had built and various churches which he constructed and various funds which he distributed to Assyrians. So some of the most prominent Assyrian political parties have been the Assyrian Democratic Organization, uh, referred to as Mtaqastar, which started in 1957, the Assyrian Universal Alliance, which started in 1968, not to be confused with the Assyrian Universal Alliance Foundation, separate organization, separate focus, um, has no connection to the Assyrian Universal Alliance other than the fact that its origins were of the um, Assyrian Universal Alliance. The Assyrian Patriotic Party, which was started in 1973, and then the Bitnahan Democratic Party, BNDP, oftentimes called, um, which started in 1974, and the Assyrian Democratic Movement, which had started in 1979, in uh, April of 1979. All of these political parties that were mentioned drew inspiration from a figure who one would not associate with being a member of a political party, Mar'i Shumun, but who put the Assyrian demands as if he were a member of an Assyrian political party representing his people before the Iraqi government and the British who happened to control the Iraqi government at the time uh, prior to the mandate of uh, Iraq ending in 1932. And the demands were, and you will see these 
being repeated in this pattern of over and over again, certainly in the past with people like Freydun Aturaya, Binyamin Arsanis and others, but in the future after 1931 through other Assyrian political parties, this desire for recognition to be recognized as a nation domiciled in Iraq and not merely as an Iraqi religious community. So this echoes into the future. And of course, there is a continued discussion about this, um, this concern that we don't want to be known merely as Christians inside of Iraq. We are more than Christians. And this, so this is echoed again and again. Um, there were other demands, of course, none of these demands materialized because the Iraqi government refused them and the British backed the Iraqi government to basically tell the Assyrians to accept whatever solution was to be given and that there was no intention on the part of the Iraqi government at the time led by King Faisal I to submit to the Assyrians any of their demands. The Assyrians would simply have to accept their religious leader simply as a religious leader and no more, and that their demands would not be entertained and they would have to accept their situation as any other people inside of Iraq. And of course, we know in 1933, the Semele massacre occurred, which thousands of Assyrians were targeted, and the Assyrian movement specifically was crushed by the uh, new state of Iraq in a particularly ruthless show of violence uh, by not only the Iraqi government's soldiers, but also other tribal groups such as the Kurds, Arabs, and including, unfortunately, the Yazidis who participated in destroying Assyrian villages, looting and uh, murdering many innocent and unarmed Assyrians. So the very first organization that one could say was formed on a formal level, there were other organizations before the Assyrian Democratic Organization in 1957, but the Assyrian Democratic Organization was a national uh, political and democratic movement um, having uh, objectives to safeguard the existence of the Assyrian people. And it put out its program in writing and advocated it much more than, say, other groups that had come before. For example, Khet Khet Allah, Khubba Khuyada Aturai, which was less organized um, and certainly did not have literature created like the Assyrian Democratic Organization. Um, the Demo this organization said the Assyrian people is the living and uninterrupted continuity of the people and the civilization of Mesopotamia. So going back to this concern about legitimacy of um, identity, legitimacy of history and a covenant with the past. So, the Assyrian Democratic Organization's main goals, if we can categorize them, was securing our national existence. Now, that's a loose term. It's a loose phrase. What does that mean exactly? Does that mean entertaining, for example, military activity? Does that mean existence on the, on the ground in terms of having a, an autonomous status? Um, it was left ambiguous for a purpose, for political advantage. Awaken and develop our national identity. So that would be across denominational lines because many of the members of the early Assyrian Democratic Organization happened to be uh, of both largely from the Syriac Orthodox and the Church of the East together, support un unity among the various denominations and work for the acceptance and recognition of Assyrian national existence in the Middle East, all of which are legitimate rights. And the ADO was largely as a reaction to the movement that Nasser fostered in Arab nationalism. It certainly was the oldest, as we said, official organization. And this is from a meeting 
that uh, I personally had with a member of the organization. And uh, it's interesting to see because this is reflective of other, it sort of encapsulates an experience that other Assyrian organizations had in Iraq and in Syria. We believed in nationalism. We argued many issues among each other and attempted to learn our language and history. We also uh, remember now when Assyrians do not have the institutions of power, the institutions of state to support them, when they do not have a powerful budget, as it were, to support their activities, what happens? So they talk to each other, they try to learn their language and history, they have this covenant with the past generations to maintain their existence. We also focused on how to be a good member in the party. We wanted to establish a renaissance within the nation. By the way, the word Ba'ath party in Arabic also means renaissance. We tried to become members in the churches, all churches, to influence people towards nationalist thinking or national thinking. We believe that we are one people belonging to different sects. So this again is repeating the message that was advocated by Binyamin Arsanis and Freydun Aturaya in Urmi by um, uh, Harputz, uh, Ashur Yusuf, and uh, Naum Fayek, uh, members of the Syriac, uh, uh, Syriac Orthodox Church, and uh, others in the Church of the East. So this is echoing what came before 50 years, over 50 years prior. There, were, there was opposition to this idea from some among our people, but this was based on ignorance. The nationalist outlook was something new according to this one member, everything was all under the churches at the time. I recall once a Syriac priest asked me what denomination I belong to. I said Christian. He said he knew, but what church? Simply to avoid the division, I told him I was a Christian. We believe that all these churches were ours and their leaders were our leaders. We avoided any clash with the church. We tried to cover ourselves under the churches. In other words, there was, of course, concern, this is in Syria, concern about seeming to be overtly political and nationalistic in a country which advocated Arab nationalism. The party was secret. If the government had known, they would arrest us and use us against each other. We often discussed what, um, we often discussed what it was that we were after. In 1974, we had a conference in Aleppo at a house there were members of the central committee so you got to remember in 1974 <clears throat> this was done in fear this is the, the gathering of this assyrian political party is much like the gathering of say these christians uh under missionaries uh in in their houses because it is against the law to be a member of the christian faith and so they gather in secret um, you know, much like the Christians in Rome when Christianity was not allowed. There were members of the Central Committee. There were about 25 members. We argued about the name. What was our name? Assyrian. We used the expression our people to avoid conflict. So we argued. We say we are one. We say all of this, but we were uncertain. I was 22 years old, this particular member says. The majority said that Assyrian is the best, Athuraya in Arabic. The ones, uh, or Athuria in Arabic, the ones who settled this ADO were from Qamishli and were from Turabdin and Mardin. They used uh, Syriac Western or Western Syriac. Uh, Shukri Charmukli from Qamishli. So they used Athuraya or Athuroyo, but some wanted the word Syriac. And oftentimes these words would be interchangeable in this particular organization. And later, the same in Iraq. So the ADO, when it came time for the liberation of Iraq, stood against the Iraqi constitution and criticized the Iraqi constitution as being uh, unfair and uh, focusing really on a uh, on the wrong thing and dividing the Assyrians. Um, this was very important for the ADO. 
The three known uh, designations, Chaldean, Assyrian, and Syriac, have been used interchangeably during the course of Assyrian history, and they felt that the Iraqi uh, constitution did not reflect that. And the Assyrian Democratic Organization was involved, uh, two key figures here, um, uh, Mr. Saadi um, and others were um, involved in various meetings with not only Assyrian parties, but also with Kurdish parties. In the beginning, they supported the Assyrian Democratic Movement, but later there was acrimony between the two organizations and there were various meetings, but they never quite established themselves in Iraq and chose largely to support the Assyrian Democratic Movement, which was the one designated to represent the Assyrian people inside of Iraq. Now, what about the Assyrian Universal Alliance? The, by the way, the Assyrian Democratic Organization is still around, not as effective as it used to be early on in the 1970s and other times, but it is still uh, active. Unfortunately, it has splintered uh, to a large extent. Well, there was a call to create another organization, an umbrella type of organization, and a letter reached the United States from Iran, and that letter was from various uh, Assyrians. In your capacity, you could contact US State Department, French, United Kingdom, Israeli, and Iranian ambassadors to the US and UN, influential senators and elected officials for the purpose of verifying them about these points, meaning this letter went on at great length about the changing Middle East and asked on behalf of the Assyrians of Iran, almost anonymously, for the Assyrians of the United States to become involved in assisting the Assyrians in the Middle East through the use of American political power. And thus far, really the Assyrians worldwide have contacted mostly the country that is most active in the Middle East, of course, is the United States, um, and as well as European uh, countries. To date, there is not much interaction between Assyrians and the Russian government, for example, because the Russian government has not been um, has not had much effect in the Middle East, certainly not on the level of the United States. So in 1968, the Assyrian Universal Alliance came together largely from uh, Assyrians in Iran and also Assyrians in the United States. And because of this, the Assyrians in Iraq, which became associated with the Assyrian Universal Alliance were suspected of being supporters of, for example, the United States or Iran or Zionism. And, uh, and this was in fact, um, I, I, and in fact, the Iraqi government, it is reputed, tried to poison Assyrians involved with the Assyrian Universal Alliance at some point. And that's a whole nother case that we can talk about in some other uh, setting, but the I just want to say the Iraqi government did, from all appearances, try to poison uh, various delegates, almost uh, caused um, certainly much pain and suffering for these Assyrians who were gathered in Australia in the late 1970s through the use of gifts that were supposedly uh, something called menesema, which is uh, a candy type of candy that was brought from Iraq to this Congress uh, being uh, conducted by the Uni Assyrian Universal Alliance in Australia. Um, the AUA became a central Assyrian organization. Uh, while it did manage to put forth some practical demands on the Iraqi government, its message to Assyrians seemed to be concerned more and more with prophecy rather than political um, practice. It continued to insist, for instance, on a national home for the Assyrians in North Iraq, despite the impossibility in terms of a budget, military power, and political influence. And so um, it 
oftentimes would use headlines like Assyria is coming back um, without really much of a foundation. And this is the first part of that letter that I, I gave you that you should, where the Assyrians in, in Iran are asking the Assyrians in the United States to engage in some political activity. The situation in the Middle East has, as you know, created uh, for the Western powers the necessity of renewed appraisal of their long range policies regarding the framework of the Middle Eastern countries and their relations with each other. The Pan-Arab chauvinism has endangered the peace and integrity of such countries as Israel, Iran, Turkey, Lebanon, and the minorities of Iraq. Assyrians, Kurds, and Shiites are seeking homogenous uh, uh, autonomy. This has been encouraged by non-Arab countries as well as a few of the great powers. Something should be done to invite the attention of the United States, Great Britain, France, and Israel to the fact that this is a high time for uh, to set up a federal republic of Iraq consisting of autonomous and uh, homogeneous ethnic states. One has to recall that the people writing this before the formation of the Assyrian Universal Alliance were being uh, pushed by uh, Iran and possibly even uh, by the United States uh, to encourage this, because we will see that this um, although it would be accepted on one level, uh, will not be later by the Assyrian Democratic Movement. Dr. Wilson Bitmansur was one of the leading advocates of the, um, of the Assyrian Universal Alliance and certainly had connections to the Shah's government, uh, Shah of Iran, was a widely respected person, a well-known Assyrian nationalist himself and played a role in the formation of the Assyrian Universal Alliance, which met in Pau in France in 1968 and pushed for the creation of an umbrella organization for the very first time for worldwide Assyrian efforts and not just Assyrians in one single country. So all of these countries, it would be similar to say the World Zionist Organization, the World Assyrian Organization under the umbrella of the Assyrian Universal Alliance. And there you see a number of personalities such as Wilson Bidmansor in the center, Daniel Crispy, who has since gone to Sweden. Um, Dr. Wilson Bidmansor has passed away and others who are from largely the United States, but they were also joined by others from Syria and Iraq as well. And the Assyrian Universal Alliance also had the support of personalities like John Yonan, who is an Assyrian businessman who's to the left here in the United States, lived in Chicago, uh, was a major supporter of refugee organization, and was the founder, along with a number of others, of what is known as the Assyrian Universal Alliance Foundation, which later separated from the Assyrian Universal Alliance. Here they are with Chuck Percy, and uh, Sam Andrews, Epram Reyes, uh, both of you, whom were to be leaders in the organization and to the right as Mark Thomas, an Assyrian attorney. According to William Nyonan, the Assyrian Universal Alliance represents all Assyrian societies and organizations in the world. So this desire to be an umbrella organization. The ultimate goal of it is to secure a homeland for the Assyrian nation in the form of an autonomous state in the northern part of Iraq territory known as the Assyrian Triangle. And the Assyrian Universal Alliance very early on generated support from various organizations. And uh, among them was the Bidnahran organization, which later uh, became a party, formed its own political party. The Assyrian Universal Alliance held various congresses. One of the earliest was in 1971 that highlighted the power of the, um, the Assyrian Universal Alliance because it was supported by the Iranian government. In fact, it was funded in part by the, um, by the Iranian government and it became very visible as a result uh, to the Iraqis themselves. And this is just before 
the war with the Kurds inside of Iraq in 1973. In 1972, partly as a result, the president of Iraq, acting with various members of the Ba'ath Party and other Assyrians who happen to be members of the Ba'ath Party in Iraq, thought that it would be a good idea since the Kurds were being given the rights to autonomy, that the Assyrians would also have rights as Syriac speakers. Now, the, the Assyrians were not recognized as a nation in Iraq. In fact, never during the time of the Ba'athist were the Assyrians recognized as a separate nation within Iraq. The Kurds were, but the Assyrians were not. But they were recognized as speakers of Syriac, Nataqeen Billugha Syriania, and were given some cultural rights. And a pardon was issued to certain Assyrians who left Iraq in 1933. Remember, this is about 40 years later. And, uh, and the Ba'ath Party tried to reflect to the world that it was reforming itself and it was giving minorities rights. But the truth is, as many Assyrians have stated and have observed and have experienced inside of Iraq during this time, this was nothing but really done for show. Now, to give you a sense of some of these meetings that took place between the um, or within the Assyrian Universal Alliance, there was this one could say almost detachment from um, reality because many of the demands that were put forth as types of political program really uh, were not based in anything that was. Um, that had any kind of basis, one could say economic or political or military of any sort, or even geographic. We request the government of Iraq to accord an autonomous status to the Assyrians in the territory between the Greater Zab and the Tigris rivers. So what exactly is being discussed here? What types of map, what types of villages, what type of demography, what type of geography exactly, other than a loose reference is unknown. And so this has been the criticism of the Assyrian Universal Alliance um, from its birth. And then the, the last is a uh, reference here, be it finally resolved that the Seventh Congress calls on all nations in the United Nation, that the Assyrian nation be continued to be historically known as Assyria and not as a religious denomination, nor a tribal sect. According to Homer Ashurian, AUA succeeded despite the odds, although the creation of the AUA did not go as it was suggested in the beginning, meaning the setup, the structure, the organization. Later, it came into the being according to a new plan, which gave the organization more credibility. Based on this plan, the AUA was established and the first Congress convened on April 13, 1968 in the Pau, France, and despite many stumbling blocks and severe blows, meaning oppositions, has continued to work and serve the ultimate goal of our beloved nation. One cannot certainly say that. This was written a few years ago uh, today, unfortunately, for the Assyrians and for the Assyrian Universal Alliance. And there were opposition groups um, Minor among them, I would say, is the Assyrian Liberation Movement, which sought a violent um, uprising against the Iraqi government or an organized uprising against the Iraqi government using military means. The attainment of our national goal, which is nothing short of a sovereign Assyria, it says in one of its uh, periodicals, and it advocated a close tie to the Kurdish struggle referred to the Kurds as our brothers and was led by a, a prominent person here in the United States and a very activist uh, Assyrian, loyal to the Assyrian cause by the name of Sliwa Samanu, who passed away in the Chicago area. This um, state senator 
John Nimrod was a member of the Assyrian Universal Alliance, was its head for some time. And he was also the head of um, the Assyrian Universal Alliance Foundation prior to its severing from the Assyrian Universal Alliance. The AUA really sought a role as a representative of the Assyrian voice internationally, and it sought to become an umbrella organization, as we said, for all other Assyrian organizations. During the leadership of Senator John Nimrod, other uh, parties gained significance, particularly the Assyrian Democratic Movement, which was formed in 1979. Uh, John Nimrod struggled with the humanitarian crisis undergoing, undergone by the Assyrians in the Middle East, especially Iraq in 1991, after the fleeing of many refugees. And he tried to balance the role of the Assyrian Universal Alliance between the desire to attain some political solution to the Assyrians on the one hand, and then a desire to fix the refugee issue and get Assyrians out of the Middle East when they needed it. And of course, the latter has an effect on the Assyrians in that it dilutes their numbers in the Middle East and really makes a solution for the plight of the Assyrians in the Middle East a much more difficult one. Despite this, the AUA had I should say, despite its grandiose plans or, or this sort of overly idealistic vision of what is to be done, it brought many Assyrians together. It re-educated the Assyrians about their past, crossed, secular, uh, crossed uh, sectarian lines, uh, and there were prominent members who advocated it, advocated for the Assyrian Universal Alliance, such as, for example, uh, Epram Reyes, who was a member of the Chaldean Church in Detroit, and Ninos Ahu, who was a member of the Syriac Orthodox Church. It also adopted the Assyrian flag and made it a very, um, you know, made a public showing of the Assyrian flag, which picked up really from the Assyrian Universal Alliance adopting it in 1971. The Bataan Democratic Party was a rival party only a few, few years later. Initially, it sought to assist, its members sought to assist the Assyrian Universal Alliance, but later separated from it. And I recall a time when in Chicago in the 1970s, there were two prominent political groups, the Assyrian Universal Alliance and the Bataan Democratic Party, and they would have these gatherings where hundreds um, sometimes over a thousand people would attend and there was very heated debate and a heated uh, conflict never came to um, violence, although some claim that there was some violence involved, uh, not serious violence in terms of assassinations or so on, but there were certainly, uh, there was friction, acrimony in Chicago in the 1970s between various political parties. But the Bidnanan Democratic Party that was formed in 1974 advocated that um, Assyrians come together and ask for autonomy. Again, repeating the um, Assyrian Universal Alliance's quest. And, and the two groups that came together were the, this group that was formed under Sargon Dadishu in, in uh, California, in Modesto, California, and the Assyrian National Quest uh, individuals in Chicago under the leadership of Giliana Yonan and others. Had presence mostly in Chicago, Turlock, Modesto, and Sydney. Sought autonomy, as we said, for Assyrians affiliated with Kurdish parties and made contact with Kurdish parties, particularly during the time of the opposition parties growing in Washington, D.C. The party is now headed by Romeo Hakkari. So two very prominent people in the party were Sargon Dadishu in the United States and still is, and Romeo Hakkari in Iraq, who is a prominent politician for the Christians, for the Assyrians in the Kurdistan regional government, within the Kurdistan regional government.
he has some um, uh, notoriety there. Sargon Dadishu became a sort of celebrity, as it were, among Assyrians. He traveled to many places in Russia and um, became a, at times a controversial figure. Um, and I, I don't want to go into this in too much detail, but uh, there are these, uh, there, there was this question or this concern on the part of some Assyrians as to where the funding was going. Um, at one point, Sargon Dadishu became the victim of an attempted assassination by the Iraqi government and won a judgment um, of 1.5 million uh, for emotional distress, uh, a case which uh, many people think was really concocted by the FBI. But anyway, um, in Russia, uh, Sargon Dadishu helped, along with others, uh, form the rise of Assyrian movements. And these Assyrian movements became active in Russia and in particularly in the 1990s and helped to uh, generate some interest, although there was um, less to do. There was uh, certainly support in Moscow and St. Petersburg and in Krasnodar throughout Russia, as well as in places like Armenia and Georgia for Assyrians who lived in those cities to sort of gather, maintain their culture, produce works of literature. One of the people that was most involved in Russia among the Assyrians in political activities was uh, a nationalist uh, by the name of Professor Mikhail Sado, who was a very learned uh, person, and he had been imprisoned in Russia for his political activities. Now we come to the Assyrian Democratic Movement, which is really the culmination of all of these political parties and many in Iraq. And the Assyrian Democratic Movement formed, I would say, for the very first time, one of the most practical uh, efforts to find a solution to the Assyrian problem. Now, how far it has succeeded is a point of debate among many Assyrians. But it started in 1979 from, and it drew on various educational, athletic, and uh, political groups, secret groups of Assyrians inside of Iraq, became part of the Iraqi Kurdistan Front, one of the five political parties in 1987. In 1992, it participated in elections and one of, was one of the seven parties that gained seats. Out of 105 seats, 50 were the Kurdistan Democratic Party, 50 were the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, and four were the Assyrian Democratic Movement. And you could see that it held sort of the power between these two political parties in its hands. The ADM members were given ministerial seats within the KRG. Yonadam Kenna became member of the governing council in 2003 and later held parliament seats as well as being the secretary general of the Assyrian Democratic Movement. This is a photograph, a rare photograph of members of the Assyrian Democratic Movement. This is Dr. Lincoln Malik, who is seated here closer to the uh, Deputy Secretary Assistant of State, David Mack with Nino Spithu and Mikhail Jaju. And in the uh, picture we also see to the left here, Senator John Nimrud, and there are a couple of other members um, that are not very visible here. And they meet with David Mack here, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. Um, and uh, George Bichlimun was also here. This is in 1993 after the crisis of 1991. Various Assyrian political parties came together and pushed for the Assyrian Democratic Movement to be a representative party for the Assyrians in Iraq and the Assyrian Democratic Movement took that role on. Now, from the perspective of the Americans, we must keep in mind 
although the hopes of Assyrians rose in terms of finding a sort of a comprehensive, a meaningful, a territorial, a political solution to their plight that involved a collective solution, the United States did not see it that way. Um, Mack, when interviewed years later, tells us that Turkey was a big factor. The Turkish government, of course, was strongly opposed to any kind of Kurdish separatism. Now, if it's opposed to any kind of Kurdish separatism, certainly it would not entertain Assyrian separatism or an Assyrian solution. Some in the US government, myself included, wanted the Iraqi opposition to be taken seriously, but we felt being unified in some way was a precondition for effectiveness. Secondly, they had to forswear breaking up the country. In other words, the United States did not want the Kurds to break up Iraq. And although in the 1970s, Mullah Mustafa Barazani was supported by the United States, one would think, and the Shah of Iran to have some kind of a independence or a meaningful autonomy, the truth was that the United States never meant to, as it were, go all the way with the Kurds. And it simply wanted them to bother the government of Iraq into conceding certain political points. And then the Shah, once he got what he wanted from Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party in Iraq, the Kurds were in effect discarded. So they were concerned that Washington would do this to them again. And Mac tells us here that he certainly, and Mac, by the way, differentiates between what the CIA wanted and what the State Department wanted. Um, and he tells us that um, uh, there would be no chance of international support from their neighbors, the Turks, the Saudis, Egyptians, Syrians, and others. In my first meeting with opposition groups, I found they spent most of their time complaining about rival opposition organizations. This would certainly be a problem with the Assyrian political parties as well. Particularly for the Kurds, I said that our main concern was humanitarian. We would not support political aspirations to a separate Kurdish nation, but we shared their desire to protect Iraqi Kurds from repression and exile. In that connection, we noted that our practical ability to help depended on a high degree on our alliance with Turkey. So I say this, I repeat these words because intertwined within the Kurdish solution for the United States was the Assyrian issue. After one meeting with a large Kurdish delegation, a Middle Eastern newspaper quoted one senior Kurdish leader as saying, quote, Ambassador Mark received us with warm hospitality and cold words. At least he understood the negative part of my message. So Mac has fun with this in that, listen, we weren't going to give you any hope that we would support you um, as we had supported you perhaps in the 1970s. That was the CIA. This is the State Department. We're not going to give you any leeway to start thinking about a separate Kurdish nation when we have no intention of supporting such a thing. And uh, there is this concern also. He tells us that uh, there was a debate underway within the administration about whether to re-engage our military forces within Iraq's borders. This is between Turkey and Iraq, when a lot of Kurds escaped, along with the Syrians, into Turkey um, to try to do something about the great potential humanitarian disaster of uh, dislocated persons in northern Iraq and southeastern Turkey, of course. Most of the affected people were Kurds, but there were also other groups like Turkmen and Assyrians. And of course, you saw the picture of Max sitting with Assyrians in 1993. His interview takes place in 1995 with the uh, Library of Congress. There were many trips made by Assyrian political groups who supported either certain political party or did not support a political party, but really desired sort of the same thing repeated again and again with members of Congress in the US. And I would say, if we're to have a bird's eye view of all of these events, it, they yielded really very little for the Assyrians themselves in terms of a practical 
an significant or a meaningful or a material solution for the Assyrian plight. And here you see various members with uh, Anna Ishu and uh, Representative Gutierrez from Illinois. She's from, uh, she's an Assyrian member of Congress from uh, California, as well as other Assyrian activists. There's the Mr. Leiden Hamas, who is the, at one point, the president of the Assyrian American National Federation and the late uh, Sargon Liwi, who is also the president of the Assyrian National Federation, among others. What was the Assyrian democratic movement and what could one say about its program? So I, I think it's very important to quote one of its most, I would say influential or if not significant thinkers, Dr. Lincoln Malik, who's no longer active in the movement. Um, he tells us in, in one of his writings in 1994, the time is ripe, this is before 2003, Time is ripe for Assyrian intellectuals to engage in a comprehensive, dispassionate, reasoned, objective, and constructive discussion toward developing a national consensus for an Assyrian strategy. He's talking about Iraq. It's important that we keep a clear perspective of our history as we chart our future. It is said that those who do not learn from history are condemned to relive it. However, this is very important for Lincoln Malik and the way he thinks we must not be mired in the history to the point of being its slaves. Those who choose to live in the past do not have much to offer for the future. So he's looking for a new strategy through the Assyrian democratic movement. And he is telling us there are several choices. Assimilation is assimilation. The solution, absolutely not. He tells us this is simplest and by definition, the most deadly solution. It calls for our assimilation in the cultures around us. In Iraq, the traitor Tariq Aziz, he refers to him, has declared himself an Arab and invites the rest of us to follow suit. In fact, he's an architect of the Arab Arabization policy offered by the Saddam dictatorship to solve the Assyrian problem. He also rejects appeasement. There are those who propose that we win our legitimate rights through appeasing those who persecute us. They claim that if we work with the dictator in Baghdad, remember this is prior to the fall of the regime, he will bestow his blessings on us. And uh, he tells us that this is unacceptable. The Ba'ath regime in Baghdad is based on the most vicious form of Arab chauvinism. The term chauvinism occurs again and again in the writings of the Assyrian Democratic Movement, which one can consider left-leaning. Zoha believes that the appeasement is a dead end and the handicraft of sellouts and quislings. And of course, he refers to several people, among them Tariq Aziz, as uh, appeasers. What about the military solution? A military solution Dr. Lincoln Maddock tells us might arguably have been an option during the First World War, were it not for the treachery of the British and major miscalculations of our national leadership. Zoa is the only entity since the massacre of Semele that has practiced armed struggle. So not necessarily a military solution, but an armed struggle under Assyrian leadership for clear Assyrian nationalist objectives. And he tells us that we also, we must do this, but we're not doing it because we're looking for a military solution. We are doing it to protect our people. We have a re responsibility to defend our people. What about culturalism? Dr. Lincoln Malik says that culturalists believe, this is his expression, his definition, that we need not involve ourselves with attempts to establish political rights, they will have us believe that teaching our language and sticking together is sufficient. However, history has proven over and over again that without political rights in our ancestral homeland, attempts at maintaining the culture are nothing short of impossible. Zoa believes that, like all other peoples in the world, we need to maintain our roots in our ancestral homeland and that political rights are necessary to promote an environment for our people to develop their culture and to live in peace and prosperity. Now, 
what happens when you don't have your people in the homeland anymore. Culturalism may become more important, but we must remember the context, the time this is being written in. This is 1994, and we are speaking over close to three decades later. Wishful solutions, of course, he tells us that this does not work as well. However, what he proposes is prog progressive pragmatism. It begins with the proposition that we are one people and that our homeland is Bitnahren. We have a homeland, we have a culture, we have a geography. We believe that all nations and peoples have the right to self-determination and that relations between peoples must be based on mutual respect, friendship, and dignity. And the Assyrian Democratic Movement has repeated this in its various lectures, organizations, rallies, defenses of its existence, that we stand for mutual respect with our neighbors and that we do not advocate what is termed chauvinism, discrimination against others for being who they are, most specifically the Kurds. Zawa categorically rejects nationalist chauvinism and all notions that demean or insult others, especially those that have shared thousands of years of history with us. Assyrians have been the victims of bigotry, intolerance, and chauvinism, again, that word, for more than 2,000 years. We cannot allow ourselves to imitate our oppressors. He's speaking in the same way that many leaders have spoken, that we do not really imitate those who persecute us. So what, are the, what do we stand for? We stand for democracy in Iraq and affirmation of our national existence in our homeland. Our destiny in Bitnahran is intertwined with that of our neighbors. In North Iraq, our people are engaged in establishing a new and qualitatively, qualitatively new relationship with our Kurdish neighbors. Assyrians are represented in the Kurdistan parliament as well as in the cabinet. We are allowed to teach our language, our national holidays are recognized legally. We are free to organize socially, culturally, and politically, and laws are passed to safeguard our land and our rights. Now, there's criticism of this of late, of course, uh, going back actually a number of years. But Dr. Lincoln Malik tells us that the road will not be easy there will be setbacks and tensions as we proceed, but Zawa firmly believes that Assyrians can and must control their own destiny. Our people thirst for a dynamic leadership well-versed in the norms of modern times, a leadership capable of leading us to safeguard our national existence and to achieve our rights as the indigenous people of Bitnahran. Zawa is that leadership and uh, I, I don't need to read the whole thing, but, our, but, but he tells us that basically we have to balance ourselves and our desires to create and strengthen our existence between you know, those who want to be timid and ask for nothing and those who want uh, have a way of seizing uh, golden opportunities um, or idealistic situations. We invite all true sons of Assyria to join us in this struggle. And of course, the Assyrian Democratic Movement suffered in Iraq, and um, it had its opposition leaders who went from members of the opposition to martyrs to today, I would say they've become icons. These images that you see of the three heroes that Assyrians revere particularly members of the Assyrian Democratic Movement. Um, and sometimes it becomes a, a point of contention, but there was no doubt that they were struggling for the Assyrian cause. The Iraqi government, of course, views it differently. It viewed these leaders who were arrested along with 150 other Assyrians um, as in, in 1985 as people who were separatists, who were possibly supporting the struggle um, uh, or supporting the war with Iran, the wrong side. They were treacherous to the Iraqi government, but for Assyrians, they are heroes because they stood for the rights of Assyrians. And later, of course, after the fall of the Iraqi regime in 
2003, the Assyrian Democratic Movement, through its head, Mr. Yonadam Kenna, became a member of the uh, ruling council, the governing council. He was one of 13, so a very significant position for the Assyrian Democratic Movement. Along with this came positions of power and influence. But what happened was that the Assyrian struggle, in effect, became part, um, became co-opted within the state of Iraq. And so the criticism that a lot of people, a lot of Assyrians whose expectations of the Assyrian democratic movement were rather high, was that although the Assyrian democratic movement gained a certain position of importance, and here you see a photograph of the gathering of in 2003 in October, bringing together all of the Christian uh, denominations under one roof, under the leadership of the Assyrian Democratic Movement and other parties that were invited, and various important personalities from all over the world and from all of Iraq, that really it did not succeed in, in both uniting and finding a solution for the Assyrians in Iraq, but rather gained seats for itself and acquired power for itself. But I think this criticism is unfair because the Assyrian Democratic Movement did certainly influence the creation of something called the Nineveh Protection Units, which is still around today, not as effective as sometimes it is advertised to be, but it is nevertheless a force uh, that protects Assyrian villages, certain Assyrian villages. And the Assyrian Democratic Movement also helped to create a kind of popular spirit and organized members from various sects of Assyrians, uh, Chaldeans, Syriac Orthodox, Syriac Catholics, others. It aimed at concrete goals. It sought and obtained a budget, which was something very important that not many organizations uh, had done. It sacrificed lives. It built coalitions with other political parties. It organized schools and educational programs, which are still in effect today. It joined the Assyrian or the Kurdistan Democratic Front and is still technically a member, a recognized member, although there's much politicking here in this regard. It had four seats that were allocated for Christians. Five were allocated for Christians. So it was the most important Christian political party in Iraq. It built networks of supporters across the world. There are chapters, approximately, I think, 19 chapters all over the world. Uh, Chicago, where we are, has a chapter. They are often called sectors. 2003 had the largest conference of Assyrians that took place in Baghdad and became really the most popular Assyrian political party as weak as it is within the larger Iraqi realm, and certainly on a regional basis, it is possibly the most effective Assyrian political party. And it won the admiration of many uh, Assyrians. And for the first time, there are many popular singers here as Ashur Bitsergis, for example, that sing about the Assyrian democratic uh, movement. And so, Given what it has accomplished, I would say, although its stated goal, as outlined by Dr. Lincoln uh, Malik, has not materialized, that may be more of a factor for one could consider as regional shifts and regional conflicts that led to Assyrians leaving uh, the Middle East and specifically Iraq, rather than um, rather than the faults of the Assyrian Democratic Movement, though certainly one could critique um, in a very serious way uh, the shortcomings of the Assyrian Democratic Movement. One also has to, on the other hand, understand that given um, the, the resources it had and the circumstances and the context and uh, the situation uh, along with uh, the paucity of political and economic power, 
the Assyrian democratic movement certainly did the best that it could.